So, Evan, um, you were actually raised in, an, in a very unique environment uh, that sought to bring together the arts and humanities, science and technology, in a, not just intellectually, but in a way of life. Um, and so I don't think it's, I, I, I can imagine some kind of line between that and the fact that you are now navigating this territory between, say, the Western mind-brain mind perspective of consciousness, viewing consciousness and studying it as a biological, biological phenomenon, and the Indian-Tibetan perspective uh, of consciousness that has some kind of primary reality, perhaps that is transcendent uh, of the body. Tell me, um, <laughs> that's the background. Um, so just, just tell us a little bit about, about that place you stand in and how you come to these issues. Uh, all right, well, since I'm in New York City, <laughs> actually I will say just a little bit about my background. Um, I was raised in the 1970s in a, in a community alternative educational institute called the Lindisfarne Association, which was actually located in the Episcopal Church at 6th Avenue and 20th Street, which is now the Limelight Market, which I walked by today. Yeah. And um, it was an organization founded by my father, William Roman Thompson, and what he was trying to do was to bring together uh, scientists, artists, and spiritual teachers from a variety of, of different uh, spiritual uh, traditions. So I was raised in a community of ongoing discussion between Buddhist monks and Buddhist philosophers and, and uh, neuroscientists and anthropologists and poets and writers. And so what's very important to me, um, what, I, what I learned from growing up in that context is that there are multiple ways of knowing and multiple ways of seeing reality. And that it's very, uh, it's very ethically important, I think, to respect that. And in my own work, what I try to work with are ways of knowing that are, on the one hand, rooted in, in science, in neuroscience. I'm a philosopher by training, and I work very closely with neuroscientists who are interested in, in mental functioning, the sense of self, and consciousness. But I also uh, work with uh, both philosophers and scientists who are interested in the neuroscience of meditation and who have a background in, in Indian and Tibetan contemplative traditions mainly. So what is at the heart of my work is really the idea that first-person mental training through, let's just call them mindfulness methods as a kind of umbrella term, that those first-person methods of mental training can help us to understand how the sense of self is constructed, how attention functions, how attention is trainable, how there are different kinds of awareness that are also trainable, how you can um, learn to differentiate in your own experience between, say, the sense of self that you have now as an embodied being sitting here in the room listening to my remarks, and then the sense of self that involves when your mind wanders and when you get caught up in a train of thought either about what you're going to do tomorrow or something that happened to you at breakfast or something you remember from your personal past, where the sense of self is now a sense of self that depends on a consciousness of time and a mental image that you have of yourself in the past or in the future. This is, these are different senses of self that are intertwined and confounded from moment to moment mixed together in our experience. And with mental training through mindfulness, one can actually see these in a first-person way from moment to moment, changing, oscillating, fluctuating. And individuals who have a great degree of training in this kind of attentiveness to their own experience um, have been shown in very concrete neuroscience settings to be able to provide information that's valuable to neuroscientists who want to disentangle different kinds of systems in the brain that construct our sense of self. For example, the sense of self that you have in your body in the present moment versus the sense of self that you have when you time travel mentally to the past or future. And individuals with mindfulness training can switch reliably between different modes of awareness in a way that um, gives neuroscientists new tools for interpreting the activity that they see in, say, the context of, of fMRI or, or uh, EEG studies. So one of the things you've said is that you advocate an embodied approach to the self, not a neurocentric one. What, what's the importance of that distinction? Well, the importance of, of that for me is that um, I think it was the, the perceptual psychologist, J.J. Uh, Gibson, who said, we need to ask not just what's in the brain, but what the brain is in. So what is the brain in? It's in a living, breathing body caught up in multiple ways with the environment, in perception and action, in a social context, 
our human sense of self, as, as Tomas was mentioning, is an intersubjective sense of self. That um, intersubjective relatedness means that the, the, the self can't be understood by simply going inside the brain and looking at neural patterns of activity. It's as if you were to try to understand Gothic architecture by just looking at the stones. It's the wrong level. It's a, it's a crucially important level, but it's not the relevant level for the intersubjective uh, sense of self that we have. So it's, what I mean by that in a nutshell is, is this larger context of embodiment and, and embeddedness. And um, it, I, are you involved in the, the mind-life dialogue? Yes. Right. yes. So the Dalai Lama is doing, is, is kind of spearheaded and set in motion a lot of this interesting dialogue between neuroscience and philosophy and religion. Um, and and I, I recently had a conversation with the Dalai Lama's translator, Tupton Jinpa, mm -hmm. who's part of those and also a, uh, a, a Buddhist scholar in his own right. And we talked about this uh, chasm that remains and that may remain, ha however fruitful and fascinating those dialogues and the research that flows from them uh, remain. Um, between a Western view of consciousness as essentially biologically rooted and limited to biology, and the far reaches of, let's say, Tibetan Indian philosophy, where there is something, um, Tupton Jinpa described it maybe as a, a stream of consciousness, not consciousness whole, not this entire thing we call the self, but something that, in fact, let's say, in Tibetan Buddhist teaching, in the person of the Dalai Lama, for example, has transcended particular bodies and time and space. So where do you, uh, where do you come out on, on that? So the, so the core of that question, as I understand it, is whether consciousness is essentially or fundamentally a biological process, or whether there's some aspect of consciousness that, that transcends biology. And then that could be interpreted in different ways. Um, I think that's an open question. It's also um, one of these things we can't prove. I think it's an open question, but I think that, it, that, that intellectual rigor and honesty requires recognizing that from a scientific perspective, as it's presently articulated in our uh, bodies of knowledge, that at least as I see it, there isn't compelling evidence that pushes us in the direction of a, of a biologically transcendent view of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And we've had this discussion with, with uh, the Dalai Lama and other Buddhists on a number of occasions, and the, the, the point we usually come to is a, is a, a mutual respect for, for different perspectives. And what I see as really the crucial thing in a way from the, that, that Buddhism brings home, but we can also see it in Western philosophy and in phenomenology, say, is not so much the metaphysics of whether consciousness transcends the brain or the body, but rather that from a Buddhist perspective, the starting point is the, is the primacy of consciousness in an experiential sense. So as a scientist, when you're examining the brain, you're doing it within an experiential framework of your own observations, your perceptions, the intersubjective agreement that you can establish with other observers, other uh, uh, conscious beings. And so consciousness in that sense as a mode of knowing is fundamental. There's no way of stepping outside of consciousness to sort of see it sideways on and to see how it relates to something else. So there I think the Buddhists are very rigorous. That's their starting point, mm -hmm. to stay with the primacy of experience. And I think they've also brought a very sophisticated uh, and ancient tradition of thinking about consciousness in quite subtle ways, right? I mean, there, there's uh, gross consciousness, subtle consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, pure luminous consciousness, right? And that those, that those terms also have become useful for, for science. Well, to take a concrete example, um, you know, Tomas said that consciousness disappears in deep sleep. And, and this is how we think about it in Western neuroscience and clinical science and in Western philosophy. In Indian philosophy, there are long, detailed, fascinating debates about whether consciousness persists in deep sleep, whether there's a kind of subliminal awareness and sense of self that's not a reflective or introspective sense of self, but it's a kind of subtle awareness that enables there to be a memory bridge between waking and sleep and dreaming. So there I think actually you know, we could make some headway using neuroscience and other philosophical resources to tackle this question about um, subtler states of consciousness that are, that are uh, you know, more difficult to understand in the spectrum and map of, of mind states.